So I'd like to keep this very informal. It's a workshop. You have a long day ahead, so please feel free to interrupt. I'm going to try to give you a sense of what high content and high throughput are, and it's slightly different concepts, so bear with me. Um, and then Lorenzo will follow. Uh, we will basically present uh, the work we have done together with also our colleague Erika Weisman, who uh, may be joining a bit later today. And uh, it will give you a sense of an applied way to sort of pose a question based on imaging and get quantifying quantifiable data out of it. So as Giovanna said, we are based at uh, the Stem Cell Hotel on the 28th floor. We are half the view of the Shard for free. So if you, if you are in the area and want to just bring your family around, just drop me an email and we can cater for that too. So we live in a very image-rich world where images become data and data become images. You can get a sense just by plotting the, the, the flights over the British Isles that there is likely to be a city here. Um, and basically, you can get information from images that become data, and equally, you can visualize data with images. So as I said, I'd like to first give you a bit of lingo and a bit of a sense of background. Part of it will maybe become a bit too easy. And then we will dig deeper into what we do and how we have applied these concepts to our work. So the first uh, um, is, is the sort of definition that high content and high throughput are not exactly the same things. So there has been a massive, uh, unprecedented uh, progress in different type of disciplines. So on one hand, the microscopy. On the other hand, the engineering that comes with the liquid handling. And on the other hand, the computation required to process all this information. And so biology can now be seen as a sort of quantitative uh, science in many, in many ways. Uh, uh, and imaging has offered a lot of help. But again, the, the concept of throughput and the concept of content are slightly different. So the idea of, of screening uh, is that you can process a great number of objects looking for those with a particular feature. So imagine bags uh, being screened uh, at, at, at an airport. And so the throughput of the screen is, is the movement of inputs and outputs through a production process. You can think of uh, a dog barking when some, uh, some dodgy smell is detected in a, in a bag. And so the number of bags will, will refer to the throughput, whereas the content is actually to do with the quantifiable information that you get through imaging out of one specific object. So the two terms are used interchangeably, but actually the, it's really a convergence of, of two completely different branches that now allow us to do high content in, in high throughput. And uh, if you see an image like this, and you have different objects, and you can think of counting them, you always have to think that uh, what's obvious for the human eye it's, it's something that the computer needs to be trained at. And the computer kind of sees an RGB images more like uh, this, so like a sort of quantifiable pixel intensities on the different channels. And then you can use uh, pipelines in order to uh, define objects from the specific channels. And you can count objects uh, based uh, on a certain threshold of pixel intensity. So Lorenzo will we'll go much deeper into this and we'll present examples. And again, our hope is to give you an introduction, but also give you a hands-on possibility to sort of use um, these pipelines to an analyze your own images. Um, there's another uh, important uh, difference that you can, you can uh, sort of bring into context when you distinguish the throughput with, with the content. So if this, this comes from a previous work we have done in, uh, in UCL. And actually, um, this is basically the response uh, to a drug of several uh, neural stem cell-like brain tumor-derived cells. And uh, you can see that they sort of arrest uh, in the presence of a drug in, uh, in early mitosis. And so you have uh, the phosphoestone H3 staining that represents the condensed chromatin that comes up. And of course, you can think of quantifying the intensity, or you can even think of quantifying objects that show a positive intensity. But then you can also, uh, and, and so in this example, you have one object in the presence of the control, zero in the second, and, and you have several objects in the presence of um, the drug. But then you can also ask the, the, the computer to look into more details. And sort of you realize that actually the objects are very different. So you have, uh, you have a mitosis happening pretty much normally in the condition A, but you have clearly uh, early mitosis happening in there. And so again, the difference between throughput and content comes into play when you want to sort of get the computer to look at the single objects and train. And there's a, a last little bit of uh, semantics comes with the idea that uh, um, you can ask the computer to detect a known phenotype. 
And so this is uh, sometimes referred as supervised clustering. So you ask a specific detection of a phenotype that you're interested in. And so like this, you can train. And uh, Cell Profiler offers uh, a, a training um, software called Cell Profiler Analyst that asks, asks you to bin in different, uh, uh, in different categories objects that you want to associate to a specific phenotype. And so, so this is, again, a supervised clustering when the use, where the user asks the computer to distinguish between different type of morphologies. But equally, you can, uh, you can do uh, unsupervised clustering. So you can sort of, for example, uh, plot over principal components the sort of effect of several drugs and sort of ask the computer, is there any drug standing out in terms of the morphology of the objects we are detecting? And so it's really this powerful interaction between a very, very systematic and, and, and dumb uh, entity, which is the computer, with, with sort of creative but, but, not, uh, but not thorough uh, mind, which is the human user, that sort of allows you to, to get, make the most out of, uh, out of this uh, process. And then, in, in some sense, the ultimate challenge that has emerged in recent years is that sometimes you may not even uh, screen for anything in particular, but you want to have a sense of how the different conditions are reflected in, in your images. And so this is sometimes referred to as profiling, which is a different concept to, sc to screening. You're not, uh, you're not uh, necessarily looking for a specific condition. You're simply understanding how conditions are different across uh, a spectrum. And so this is an example, for example, of, uh, of our recent work where we, we have simply asked the question among the different objects, the, how are the phenotype feature linked one to another? If a cell is bigger in the area, does it always come with like lower intensity of EDU, et cetera? So you can build a biological meaning by comparing the phenotypic feature one to the other. And this has got nothing to do with screening. So I think it's important to just play with these concepts in your head and. Um, and kind of think how to apply them. So the way we apply them is to keep the readout and the content as simple as possible. So we are a strong believer in, uh, uh, for example, dyes when you, when you don't need to use the immunofluorescent antibody, L less time in the, in the assay as possible. Kind of ju just, just try and simplify your assay as much as possible. Then the second point we, we are really fond of, and Lorenzo is, is a master in this area, is, is sort of like uh, thinking OK, we live in a 3D world, but we don't always necessarily need to get 3D information. You can challenge the cells to uh, 2D conditions <coughs> that represent that 3D world. So sometimes people refer to this as 2.5D. This is my colleague, Erika Weisman, who will help later with the session. And uh, so sometimes people refer to uh, 2.5D in the sense that, for example, if you challenge a cell to cross uh, in a capillary or to pattern into a defined area, you are asking 3D questions, but you're actually asking them in a way that is amenable to 2D imaging. So this it has, has many advantages over um, the, we do also work with 3D and spheroids, but I think people underestimate the power of these approaches. And then the most important thing, and I shouldn't tell this to, to this uh, audience, is to focus on relevant cells. So uh, in, terms of, in terms of translational, uh, output uh, for decades, people have been focusing on cells that were very easy to use, but very remote from the actual um, disease modeling and, uh, and, uh, and sort of relevance for human. And now there's a big shift into sort of using primary cells or iPS-derived cells. I'll give you an example of this. So in, uh, in terms of what we have been doing uh, in the last years at King's, we have been focusing on uh, the Human Induced Pluripotent Stem Cell Initiative, which is a project that aims to collate the images with the other data sets, with genomics, transcriptomics, and proteomics. And so in this work, we were partnering with uh, the Wellcome Trust Sanger Institute that has derived a big panel of lines. The proteomics was done in Dundee, and uh, we did the phenotyping. And the ABI has helped us managing this data on, on a website, hipsy.org, that collates all this information. And so if you go on this website, you have a list of IPS-derived lines, and you have available arrays that give you data of, across the platforms of the DNA, the RNA, and the protein, and the phenotypic feature of the cells that we have analyzed. And now we have also, uh, thanks to the image data resource in Dundee, we have also presented our raw images there. So we welcome any analysis that sort of aims at uh, um, collating the response um, under the different conditions with the, the genomics to be sort of tapping into this resource. 
And I think the beauty of this uh, is that we sit precisely in between the reductionist type of data sets that you find uh, um, in uh, like ENCODE and the Uniprot, et cetera, and the biobanking. So we, we really, these are, these are early naive forays into the idea of sort of defining a space of feature and then open to the science the access to the lines and to the data. So imagine all of us going to, to Cambridge, donating some blood, then a little bit of uh, tissue is taken out of our arms, and then fibroblasts are derived, and they're reprogrammed into IPS. And then we start asking the question, are three clones from one of us more similar to each other than from different individuals? And this is very important because disease modeling all, often presents you three lines from a, from a healthy volunteer versus three lines from a patient, but there's very little understanding of the baseline and the type of variance between the lines. And so we published in Nature this flagship uh, work on sort of describing the project. Uh, this is a couple of years ago now. And uh, uh, we present the pipeline that I've just described that is based on quality control at different stages. And we also have as deliverables a copy number anomaly maps, a quantitative trait loci map that connects the single nucleotide variants with the RNA variation. And then we've, we've asked precisely this question, if you look on the bottom left, so across the array of DNA, RNA, and protein, and cell phenotyping, how much of the variance is explained by cells being part of the same donor. So you can refer to that in, um, for, for, for the sort of scope of HIPS as a whole. I'll quickly go through the work we have done on these cells in terms of imaging, so, so you get a sense of um, the type of platform I described. And uh, so we have basically used this trick of putting the cells into different type of environments. So again, if we come back to the analogy of this group of people and we want to make the most of the content in terms of imaging, the best bet is to ask every one of us to sort of stand up, walk, and run. And then we can, take, we, we can make blurry movies of how the movement is detected. And then we can take very sharp images so we can basically segment the, the shape of uh, everyone. And again, challenging condition coming from the extrinsic environment help increase the content that you can detect when you want to answer this question about how different the conditions are for different individuals. And so in, in this case, we have used uh, three concentration of fibronectin across 110 cell lines from 75 individuals. And you can see by bird's eye view, uh, so you have the, the technical replicates inside each row, but then the bi biological replicates from row to row. You can see that there is noise, but consistently um, cells tend to be larger in area, for example, across a uh, higher concentration of the extracellular matrix. This becomes clearer if you look at the single images. So this is a typical image you would have on, uh, on the operetta uh, Mark I. We now use the operetta CLS, which is um, better than this. Um, you can basically have a, a very clear definition of the nuclei based on the DAPI. You can uh, discard uh, uh, objects that do not uh, really fit the characteristics of, of being a nucleus. And then using a cell mask, we look into uh, detecting the, the contour of a cell, so the cytoplasm. And then we've worked uh, quite a bit in sort of bringing context features into play. So we, we have taken work from uh, Chris Bacall's group and modified it for these purposes. And we can distinguish a single cell versus a cell in colonies. So we can ask how many cells are present in a colony and then bring the very same number into an SQL. So you can seamlessly capture phenotype emerging upon cell-cell contact, for example. We've started working separating the cells that are single and, and in clumps, but actually it's much better to sort of form a, a, a unique uh, data set with all the objects. And uh, when you plot these objects, of course, you can see that there is a difference in um, the effect of the extrinsic environment. And then we spent quite some time in sort of defining what this difference was. And this was work mainly uh, done by Alessandro Vigilante and Andreas Leha in Richard Durbin's group. And uh, basically, you can, uh, you can separate a sort of synthetic factor that captures the information that comes from the extrinsic environment. So in the top left, you can see that if you ask uh, how does this factor changes in the different conditions, you can see that there is a clear uh, separation of this factor. And this will be a little bit of nucleus roundness, a little bit of uh, cell being in contact, a little bit of cell spreading, etc. 
And uh, we have uh, looked into a factor that similarly could capture intrinsic machinery of a cell based on the idea that maybe cells from the same donor would express a similar type of phenotype. And we could land on something that, uh, as a surrogate, something that was showing a correlation between two lines from the same donor. So we are not sure that, uh, that we are really capturing something that is part of the intrinsic machinery, but it, what is promising is that if you crawl onto the gene expression and you look at the gene ontologies, you do come up with very uh, uh, metabolic and like nuclear related type of uh, gene expression, whereas in the, in the extrinsic factor, you can associate with transmembrane receptor, et cetera. So this is just a snapshot to tell you what you can do when you try and associate the images with the other biological data sets. Uh, and then we also push this to sort of define phenotypic outlier into association with single nucleotide variants. So we looked specifically into integrin and we looked specifically in cell spreading and we could define that uh, low spreading would correlate to a single nucleotide variant. Just, uh, just a bit of a um, kind of showcasing, this is published and uh, it kind of gives you a sense of how we've used uh, these methods. But basically, we are very interested in developing methods that would benchmark the cells. So this is a, a, an activity that we have in collaboration with our users, and we welcome scientists from different universities and also from industry to sort of come in and plan with us platforms that could really start asking the question. We have pushed forward in terms of characterization. Most of our work has been done on 2D. I'm just gonna show you in the last few minutes a few examples of how we push this into the 2.5D and the 3D, and then I'm gonna leave you uh, with the questions and, uh, and sort of more uh, practical type approach. But basically, the, what I think is very important when you think about why we are doing these things is that uh, we are wired because of the deliverable in sort of thinking about science, uh, science and in particular biology as an hypothesis-driven activity. And this has, been, this has been the case for, for a long time. Now there is a really a clear emergence of, of a data-driven activity. And there was an interesting debate a few years ago in Nature between kind of people that were pushing forward one thing or the other. But I think it's, it's really important that we sort of clarify where we stand or clarify the synergies between these two approaches because this has profound implication for, for funding and communication of science. If you're interested, I've, I've written a small book chapter about it. But also it has very import, important implication in how you process the information you are obtaining. So this is stolen from the Human Cell Atlas from Aviv Rejev, and basically, well, the, the right part, the, the, the left part is uh, an Archimboldi painting. So. But basically, the, 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 the idea is that you can always define where um, the, the data you're, you're obtaining, sort of what, type of what type of perspective the data you're obtaining uh, give you in terms of observing the, the natural phenomenon you're trying to observe. And so just to leave you with a sense of the activities and how you can engage with us, we, we are born from research. We are very fond of research and we are very fond of science, but we are bringing this now as a service, matching the capability that we have in both live imaging and in, in uh, endpoint assays. I haven't touched upon live imaging, but there's some methods published and I'd be, I'd be happy to answer questions in that respect. Uh, we have... Uh, combine the, the sort of biological assays with uh, a lot of uh, uh, work on the sort of um, software to, to develop. Some is proprietary, some is, uh, um, is developed by us, and some is open source. And we, again, we combine these sort of approaches. This is an example. We can subtract uh, the feeder layers from uh, human iPS cells and sort of focus the information from uh, the colonies that the pluripotent stem cells present. Uh, we can do these things uh, um, in 2D, as I said, and we've published several papers here, but we can also push this into the 2.5D. So if you confine cells into one millimeter pattern that are pluripotent, and then you expose them to BMP4, you have uh, endomeso and ectoderm formation that happens in a very sort of topographically constant way. And so we're looking into these ways to develop pluripotent assays in their own right. Typically people, put cells in uh, uh, experimental models, or they use a pluritest based on gene expression. Here you have a phenotype that is actually uh, quantifiable like uh, pluritest is. And uh, we are doing similar work on, uh, on 3D. So we have uh, spheroids that are uh, proliferating in suspension. This is work by Hanin Alceli in collaboration with uh, Eileen Gentleman's group. 
And so we are now uh, exposing these cells in different conditions and starting to understand how they, this would impact in the, and, and bring the genetic variants in in the future. Uh, so the aim is precisely to, to benchmark cells. So we offer possibilities to sort of compare conditions but also quality control conditions so that you are sure that you are working with the cells you're interested in. But we are uh, also uh, tapping into previous work done in iPS derived cells and I just put in this because it may be relevant for, for this community. So here we have simply imaged uh, in live uh, uh, iPS derived uh, neural epithelial cells um, exposed to 160 kinase inhibitors. And you can basically uh, observe that the top hits, which are all rock kinase inhibitor, uh, basically proliferate faster. So even by measuring the confluence on the left, so the area covered by the cells, you can capture compounds that uh, um, can expand the population. The fact that they are rock inhibitor makes it not rocket science, but we do have a platform that can actually allow you to expand specific compounds, sorry, allow to identify specific compounds that specifically expand the cells of interest. And similarly, this was work that we've done in 2013, uh, and it's uh, an example of how you, you can uh, go further and not just be happy with the confluence of the cells, but you can start uh, through cell profiler and uh, the pipeline that Lorenzo will touch upon, uh, identify object overlaying a mask to the Incusite movies. And this allows you to, quant to quantify the cells and also to capture with the red dots when a cell engages into early mitosis. So I'll close here with the, the work that uh, Erika and Lorenzo have been doing uh, with us. Uh, and basically, um, this is a comparison between an iPS-derived endothelial cell versus a primary cell. So we have uh, obtained these 40x images on the left. We have worked on a specific pipeline that have uh, allowed us to identify complex features like the, the junctions between cells. And we have uh, um, also been able to use some of these features as a surrogate for biological, bi biologically meaningful features like the notch uh, intensity. Um, and the, the aim, again, is to define how different iPS DRI cells will be from primary cells. And uh, so I'll leave you with this, and uh, I'm happy to take questions, or, or we can take questions later together, as you prefer. And this is just, uh, if you're interested in stem cells, we have this uh, London Stem Cell Network event at the Creek later on. So thank you very much for your attention.